Scully was born in 1920, the only child of a middle-class couple in New Haven, his father a Chevrolet salesman who became a local alderman, his mother a housewife who had aspirations of singing opera. In the 1920s, <coughs> New Haven was very much a city, not a huge one, but a prosperous small city in the way that almost every small American city had a certain kind of provincial prosperity to it. <coughs> a few things distinguished New Haven, however, and they would all leave their marks on Scully. The city's plan, with its famous nine squares, was the most notable. So was its natural geography, set between East Rock and West Rock, unusual huge rock outcroppings for a northeastern waterfront city. This, there was urban planning of the highest order, with public space at its heart. And there was that powerful and beautiful natural feature about which Scully would write, it blazes at sunset like a butte bursting up from Arizona to dominate the Connecticut shore. So it was in this small, comprehensible city that was New Haven that Scully came first to think about themes that carried through all his work. <clears throat> the belief that architecture has a social purpose, the shaping of community that confers a meaning that goes beyond its purely formal qualities. As he would put it many years later in another context, what he valued most about architecture was its connection to the actions of human beings and the effect of physical forms upon their spirit. And it was the connection between East Rock and West Rock and the waterfront and the streets of New Haven that gave Scully his first sense of what he would consider the critical balance for architecture, the harmony between the natural and the man-made, something he be so believed in that he would come to take that phrase, the natural and the man-made, as the title of one of his books. The third thing that distinguished New Haven, besides the nine squares plan and the striking natural setting, of course, was Yale. The only place Scully studied after he graduated from Hill House High School. It is where he received all his degrees, where he taught for six decades, and became one of the most celebrated and influential faculty members of modern times. His final book, Yale and New Haven, Architecture and Urbanism, written with his wife, the architectural historian Catherine Lynn, with other contributions by Eric Vogt and by me, published in 2004, is nominally an, an analysis of the relationship nearly three centuries long between Yale and its city an issue Scully had been reflecting on, <coughs> it is fair to say, for his entire life. It's a book that analyzes the campus and the city and studies how architecture both reflected and influenced the city and the university's long and mutually dependent but also adversarial relationship. It's also in many ways the culmination of Scully's complex relationship to Yale, an attempt to pull together what New Haven and Yale had meant to him. <clears throat> now, relationships between universities and the cities in which they sit have often been studied as political and economic. Scully's book was one of the few that looked at it purely in architectural and symbolic terms. University buildings, Scully wrote, should be among the city's most enduring. It is, after all, something like immortality they deal in, offering an escape from the restrictions to life that ignorance imposes. This should be especially true of Yale in New Haven, God's city under the mountain, haven of exiles, heaven on earth for all mankind to see. We can see the direct influence, indeed the inspiration of New Haven also in such earlier works by Scully as American Architecture and Urbanism, originally published 
1969. This is a great book, <clears throat> perhaps the closest he ever came to transferring the experience of his lectures to the printed page. <clears throat> it was in this book that Scully, describing the relationship of Peter B. White's Street Hall, Swartwout's old Yale Art Gallery, Louis Kahn's new Yale Art Gallery, and Paul Rudolph's Art and Architecture Building, sited beside one another along Chapel Street at the edge of the campus, offered one of his most famous and most resonant definitions of architecture, which he called, and I quote, <coughs> a continuing dialogue between the generations which creates an environment developing across time. It is one of Scully's most quoted lines, and it is important to remember that it was inspired by what he saw in New Haven. Indeed, by what he saw just outside this door on these blocks of Chapel Street. It is no exaggeration to say that Scully had something of an 80-year-long lover's quarrel with Yale. He believed deeply in the university, and at the same time, it drove him crazy. Then again, he drove it crazy. He criticized the university's architectural decisions constantly in his lectures, and his relationships with the presidents he knew and liked best could probably all be described as consisting of stresses interrupted by periods of tranquility. <laughs> that was true even of Whitney Griswold, who Scully encouraged to hire Louis Kahn to design the Yale Art Gallery in 1951, the most sig first significant work of modern architecture at Yale, and the one Scully always felt was the best. Scully deeply admired Griswold for his commitment to building modern architecture at Yale. In a long oral history interview with Jeffrey Cabaservice, he referred to Griswold's deep convictions about building serious modern works here. But he also, of course, thought highly of Kingman Brewster and Rick Levin, Rick Levin, if in different ways. Many of the stresses involve Scully's fury over the loss of what he considered to be key buildings on the campus like Sheffield and North Winchester Halls, which were torn down in 1967 to make way for Marcel Breuer's Becton Hall, which Scully detested. He probably hated Beinecke Library even more. Just because of Bunshaft's design, not because of the loss of anything to make up for it, to make way for it, rather. I don't know that he ever came to terms with this building, as many of the rest of us who hated it for a long time eventually came to do. He did, however, make a peace with Eero Saren and Zingle's Rink, which he said, and I quote, was cited with no regard for its surroundings, had no place on a street was in every way a shameless intrusion. <laughs> On the other hand, and I'm still quoting, nobody could really perceive until later what a wonderful place it was in which to watch hockey. <laughs> how it swooped with the puck and reverberated with speed and violence and how, with too many people inside it, the better it became. <clears throat> Scully was more than a little impolitic in his constant criticism of the university over many of its architectural and preservation decisions, including allowing the Davies Mansion on Prospect Street to deteriorate almost to the point of collapse, though it was later beautifully restored as Betts House. And late in life, <coughs> he fought Rick Levin over plan changes to the Yale Divinity School and even over some of the college renovation plans. But he was <coughs> more than the local architectural curmudgeon. He could also be remarkably perceptive, and as we've seen, subtle and willing to take in empirical evidence and shift his observations. 